bit about the book. We're gonna, I'm going to give you really random what appears to be useless trivia every week for the next four months about the book of James. That's how long we're going to be in these five chapters. And so here's some random trivia for you. Random trivia number one, that James is one of the first books of the entire New Testament to be written. That it is one of the absolute, if not the absolute first book to be written. It was written in mid-50s AD, and Matthew and Mark are the next ones to have been written, and they were also mid to late 50s AD. So it's interesting that when the church is forming after Jesus ascended, this was been about you know, 35 AD, for about 20 years, the church is trying to figure out how to do things, how to structure things, and then they run across, James writes this letter. And the question then comes, which James? So verse 1 starts off by saying this, James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Some translations say James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, because the word slave has such negative connotations in today's society. In scripture, there are two types of slavery. There is slavery that is forced at the abduction of other people and clearly labeled as sin over and over again within the Old and New Testament. However, there's a second type of slavery that's a type of servitude to where you are either in debt or, or, or having a hard time making your income be higher than your expenses. You're getting ready to go broke. So you choose to sell yourself to someone. Say, hey, I will work for you if you will then cover my expenses. We, we call that employment today. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but it was kind of like that back then, a type of employment, if you will, but it was a type of, of slavery. You would sell yourself into slavery. Then later in the New Testament, that form of slavery became viewed on a theological level to where you're recognized, every person in that bad time period would recognize themselves as either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Either way, you're serving a master. Either way, you, are, you have that employer over you. So either you're going to be a servant to sin or you're going to be a servant to Christ, one or the other. So this James starts off by saying he's a servant or he's a slave. But which James is this? Okay, which one is it? There has been so much debate. And, and if we were doing a full Big Bang Theory type episode, I would go into all these great jargon and, and terms and, and avoid vernacular phrases and be totally socially awkward about it. Instead, I wanted this to be at least somewhat educative for you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the options of who the James could be. And there's been, I'm telling you, there's been debate on this. I know it sounds stupid. Like, what does it matter? Let's just read the letter. Well, if you got a letter from your mom or a letter from a stranger down the street, would you read it differently? Would you take the comments said in it differently? If they started telling you that you're living something wrong, you need to change something, and it came from your mom versus a stranger, which one would you accept? Did you go, oh, mom, butt out of my life? Or who does this person think they are? They don't even know me. Okay, so we kind of got to look at the authorship here that is actually very important. So if you look at the letter of James, if you will, and then ask ourselves, who are the potential candidates? So let, let's kind of take a look at these a little bit. There's just a, a few names here. First, we got James, son of Alphaeus. That, that's a potential candidate. We got James, son of Zebedee. He was one of the 12, by the way. That's, that's the uh, uh, disciple James. We got James the Less. You got to love a name like that. That's a good esteem building name right there. Right? <laughs> yeah, James the Less, he was the son of Mary. Uh, I know that's not the same Mary of Jesus' mom, Mary. There's like four or five Marys of the New Testament. It gets real honk and confusing. Even the name James was a common name back then. It's like the Greek version of Jacob. Okay, so just imagine just walking into a room in like the 1990s and yelled, John. Okay. In fact, one time I went to a Promise Keeper event, and I was a part of a church in Holland, and we went to Detroit, and we're in, this, in the, in the uh, big uh, uh, football stadium there, and we're sitting in a chair, and there's myself, John, and then there was this guy named Dan right in the middle, not my father-in-law Dan, a different Dan, that's a common name too. So there's myself, then there's Dan, and then next to him was the pastor John McCarty. Before him that came with us, in front of him directly was a guy named John Dick, and the guy behind it was another guy named John. So then Dan looked up and he went, hey John, and all four of us went, yeah? <laughs> it was a, it's a common name, okay? So James is the same way, very common name. Like it just, it's the name of Jacob. So we got James the less, son of Mary. We got James the father of Judas. 
There's a great name to be proud of. Jesus had a brother named Judas. You have to really feel bad about that guy. If your name is Judas and you're the brother of Jesus, how do you tell people, no, not that Judas, <laughs> you know? But nonetheless, then there's James, Jesus' brother, James, okay? So those are the, the most common candidates there for that. And people have been arguing back and forth, which James is it? For the longest while, the belief was that it was uh, James, Jesus' brother. Then for a while, around 400 AD up through about 1700 AD, they started going with James the less or James the father of Judas or one of the other ones, James the uh, son of Alphaeus, because they didn't want it to be the brother of Jesus because the belief was in this idea of what's called the perpetual virginity of Mary, that Mary was a virgin her entire life, and therefore all she did have children, or if she did, her virginity was protected, and they rejected the idea of her having brothers and uh, Jesus having brothers and sisters. Maybe they were like stepbrothers. Maybe Joseph was married before, had kids, and then his wife died. Then he married Mary, and all these crazy theories all came about. And so I would like to offer to you my big James theory. And we're going to have to, I'm going to present my case. You're welcome to disagree with me. That's perfectly fine. Everyone's entitled to be wrong, and I don't care. That's <laughs> but I will present to you <laughs> my point of view, and this is important because I'm going to approach this letter from this point of view for the rest of our series. And it's going to influence everything that is going to be about this interpretation. And so, my view... My wonderful big James theory is that it was Jesus' brother, James. Okay, that's the view that I'm going to hold. I'm going to go all the way back to the early church, and I'm going to agree with them, and I'm going to hold that it was indeed Jesus' brother, James. And for some of you that are deep Bible students, and you've read through commentaries, and, or maybe you got one of those Bibles with those little footnotes at the bottom that aren't inspired, and you're looking at all the study notes, you say, well, what it says here, Jesus' brother, so... Big deal. Well, how do we know? Why am I holding that to be kind of my, my view? And I would like to share with you a couple of reasons why. Reason number one, in the book of Acts, chapter 15, there's a guy named James that is clearly Jesus' brother, James. He's one of the leaders in the church. Okay, he was basically, if you will, second in command. You had Peter, who was like the first among equals. He was the big leader of the church. And then you had amongst the elders, you also end up getting James, Jesus' brother, James. Okay, now in Acts chapter 15 is a statement, and also throughout the book of Acts is a, also an additional letter written by James that is starkingly similar to the book of James. Okay, they're very, very similar in content and style and structure. And so it seems like that if that was for sure Jesus' brother James, then this is likely Jesus' brother James as well. Secondly, uh, James, the other Jameses, Jameses? The other James, yeah, plural, is. <laughs> the other Jameses don't have the authority or fit the bill. Like when you look at the disciple James, he kind of died before the letter was written, killed by Herod. Okay, so I think it's unlikely that it's him. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> and on and on. It would be just, it, none of them really seem to fit the bill. They don't have the same level of authority that the James who was the, second in command of the church would have. Okay, it's one thing you just got some James that was the dad of someone. It's another thing when it's a, one of the leaders in the church, okay, who ended up being the head senior pastor of the mother church of Jerusalem, okay? James ended up being that mother church's pastor. He was the head church pastor for a while. After Peter stepped down, James took over. Jesus' brother, James, Okay, so it, it, he would be more apt to write with further authority. In fact, he has the most authority of all the Jameses, so much so that even Paul, who wrote like half the New Testament, even Paul submitted to the authority of James. Okay, Paul in Galatians chapter 1 says that he was, had been visited by Christ, wanted to be declared as and showed that he was an apostle, and he submitted to the authority of Peter and James. Okay, so he recognized the authority of James, Jesus' brother. Then I'm like, okay, that shows he is the most authoritative possibility. Then there's another one, okay, that James calls himself by what title in James chapter 1? The servant of Jesus, of God and Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
okay? The fact that he does not say the brother of Jesus proves he's his brother. Case over. <laughs> okay, I'll have to explain that last one. <laughs> Just a little bit, okay? <laughs> of all the other Jameses, what did you notice about their name? James, son of. James, father of. James, whatever. Because that those Jameses were not known. Those Jameses, they, they were unfamiliar. They weren't as famous, if you will. And if you are the most famous James in the world, do you need to clarify your point of view? No. Okay, so James does not have to say brother of Jesus because they already know who he is. And it's interesting that he, and if this is indeed the case, which I believe it is, it's fascinating then that he doesn't mention Jesus being his brother intentionally as if to avoid being given any unique authority just because of his family relationship. Because some, some of us do that, don't we? When we find somebody that's famous and we meet them, we like the name drop. We have to be able to say, well, you know, the other day when I was walking through Kalamazoo and I bumped into Chuck Norris and he told me, or the other day, you know, when I was in Chicago and I met Robert De Niro there, we had lunch together and then Tom Hanks showed up. And it's like, man, you, you, we, we drop it as if somehow that raises our significance. You know, I mean, how many, I, I heard several times, man, you know, I was at the food fair and I met Jennifer Fugo. And so I'm like so <laughs> special now. <Yeah. laughs> okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm like high and mighty because I met a celebrity. And, and we go on and on with this idea of name dropping, okay, because we think that increases our authority. And James, James could have done that. He could have said, I am Jesus' brother. Bow to me. No. He's more humble than that. He doesn't want that undue authority like that. He already has the authority properly positioned to him as a leader in the church, and he doesn't want to be placed above Peter. So he doesn't go through bragging about his upbringing, bragging about where he came from, or anything along those lines. So here's James, Jesus' brother, saying, I am a servant. Jesus is not just my brother anymore. Jesus is different than just my brother. He is Lord, capital L. He is God. In fact, the translation of this verse could technically read and be completely appropriate in his translation and in grammar to say, James, servant of the Lord and God, Jesus Christ. It can render that way because how you do Greek interpretation is the ending of words that give it the word order and you got to kind of translate that out and it can go either way. Either way is still you're calling him Lord and to call him Lord capital L, not that British uh, Monty Python Lord, if you don't mind, you know, it's not king type Lord. This is a master ruler of my life Lord, okay, to, to call him that, it, that's the identity Jesus is to him now. He's not focused so much on, hey, big bro, when you have a moment, would you mind helping me move my sofa? Okay, that's, that's not the relationship James is viewing here. This is more of, you are master of my life. Okay, so that's James's opening there. That's how he deals with that. But that's not where he started. That's not where James started. His story is fascinating. It is the history of James is so interesting because he started by doubting Jesus. He started not believing Jesus was God. Jesus' own brother rejects him. Okay, that's how James started. He started rejecting Jesus. So let me show you exactly how this unfolds and how this takes place. This would be in uh, Matthew. We're going to look at several different passages as we unfold the story of James rejecting Jesus. Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50 is where Jesus is uh, talking to a bunch of people. He goes into a house. He's inside this house. He's preaching. He's teaching. He, he's, he's healing diseases, doing a whole bunch of neat stuff. Okay, so while he's there, he was still speaking, verse 46, to the crowd when suddenly his mothers and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, Jesus, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But he replied to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? 
and stretching out his hands toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. Sounds like Jesus is dissing his family. Okay, what's going on here is the way Matthew writes, and we did a whole long series in Matthew called Jesus the Transformer. You're welcome to go to our website, anchorcommunitychurch.org, hit the streaming link, and hit the like archived letters and see our whole Matthew series and watch it. And you, go, you can fast forward to chapter 12 if you want and see the big details on this. Uh, let me just give you the snapshot, the real quick uh, flashback scene, if you will, uh, would be that how Matthew writes is that his fam, Jesus' family, were on the outside of the house, not on the inside. Therefore, they are outside of God's will. That's how Matthew liked to write. He wrote where it wasn't just the what, but the so what. There's a theological intention involved. So the family's on the outside. They're not on the inside. They're refusing to go inside. They don't want to go in where Jesus is teaching and preaching. They don't want to go where he's doing all of that. Instead, they are wanting to talk to a stranger and say, could you go and get him and tell him to come out here? Could you go in there? Could you tell him to come out? And just in case you're thinking I'm reading way too in on that. Okay, we can go to book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 21, a parallel account of the same thing, where it says Jesus' family heard what he was doing, and they sent out to restrain him because they said... He is out of his mind. Okay, that restraint literally means to arrest or to seize. Okay, so they show up and they want Jesus to stop teaching, to stop preaching, because they think he's lost his mind. They think he is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They think he has gone off the absolute deep end. And you have to admit, this, this makes sense. I know for us today, it, we're, we're, a lot of people in the world knows that within the uh, Christianity that we believe Jesus is God and the Bible says it and, and we, we got it. We, we, we figured that out. People at least understand that. They may not agree with it, but they understand that point of view. Back then, could you imagine this? If you're, who here has a brother? I'm just curious. Who here has a brother or has a spouse with a brother or something? Like, okay, if you were to go onto Facebook and under about he would have put, I'm God. You know, so let's just think this through for a second. <laughs> you go onto Facebook, you go to your brother's page, and you're looking and you're scrolling down, and then it says, I'm God. And you're like, really? <laughs> I know you had a really good self-esteem, but this seems like a little bit of an overshot, just ever so slightly. You know, really, you're you're. You think you're God? Satan, maybe, but, but God? <laughs> really? You know, and, and it would be weird for a, I mean, and for a mom to give birth to a child and have that child grow up, even though there's an angelic message to Mary and even though all that's going on, he is going around preaching and ticking off the religious leaders at the time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's going around calling them baby snakes uh, a brood of vipers, uh, to put it in the terms of Austin Powers, he is saying that their mom shagged the devil. Okay, that, that's what Jesus is saying about the religious leaders. This is not a polite statement he's using. Okay, and, and, and he's ticking them off, and they're looking to kill him. And Jesus' family are like, we love him. Okay, this is not a family that does not love Jesus. They love him. They think he's been out in the sun too long. <laughs> They think his blood sugar is really low. They think he's just out of his mind. And so they want to go get him, pull him from the public scene and say, now Jesus, if you're not careful, you're going to get yourself killed. There's irony there because that's just what Jesus wanted. Not suicidal, but Jesus wanted to be the sacrifice for the sins for all people for all time. That's what he wanted, to die on the cross. That's why he was born. That was his purpose. But the family just had a hard time grasping that, especially when you live with a guy for 30 years. 
especially when you're telling jokes with the guy, especially when you're hanging out, maybe you're, I don't know, playing Angry Birds together. Okay, that's right, the web wasn't up that yet, just quite yet. So they were, they were on their PDAs, doing whatever they were doing back then. And they're just having a good time, and they're growing up 30 years with the guy that, that they you know, had punching lessons with, and maybe played Pull My Finger, I don't know. A little bit of Duck Dynasty going on, you know, just, just a bunch of, of guys having a good time together. And now one of them is left, he went and saw some barefoot, hairy, camel skin wearing, itchy, smelly speaker at a lake named John the Baptist, and he dunks him in the water, and then Jesus comes out and goes off into the wilderness for a while, coming back, preaching and teaching and making all the leaders mad. Coming back and just really upsetting the status quo. And they're like, has he joined a cult? <laughs> we gotta save him. <laughs> And they're going to go and seize him and take him out. And it could even be that the brothers, James and Judas and the others, were feeling guilty. Maybe they're even feeling responsible for Jesus' behavior. Because in the book of John, chapter 7, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see your works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public uh, recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then John adds this afterthought. For not even his brothers believed in him. That's interesting. Why would they say go, go on CNN? Go to Fox News. Go grab your Twitter and place it out there. Go out and do all of that. Go for it, Jesus, because they don't believe him. What they're basically saying is, we're right, Jesus is wrong, and if it takes him failing to prove it, then so be it. I don't know if you've ever done that with someone, you disagreed with them, and you end up getting to the point of just saying, you know, if that's the way you want to be, just go for it. Just go for it. Just Head over heels, go for it. And then thinking inside, they're going to fail. This is going to blow up in their face and they, it will show them that they were wrong and maybe they'll trust me next time. Ever been there? You know, parents have to get there at some point like this with their teenage children and their young adult children where they got to let them fail and they got to let them struggle and realize for themselves the consequences for behavior and actions and choices that that has to happen at some point. And that's kind of what the brothers are doing. Go for it, Jesus. Go for it. Just if that's the way it is, if this is how you view things, then why are you staying around here? Go for it. Just go out there and have at it. Of course, then Jesus starts getting himself almost killed and maybe they begin feeling a little bit like Joseph's brothers who gave away their brother into what could be death and likely death. And now they're feeling maybe the similar type of guilt. And they're like, Mom, you know how Jesus has been acting kind of funny? Well, we told him to go out there and do that. And, and we kind of thought this would all blow over, that he would go out there and nobody would pay attention, that it would all just blow up. But it didn't happen. That isn't, isn't what took place. And now they're listening to him even more. And the leaders, the police, the, the religious leaders, all the nut, religious nut jobs everywhere are now getting ready to really come down. Mom, we, we, we screwed up. And I can just picture Mary being the great Jewish woman that she is, grabbing the boys by the ear, giving a little twist, saying, come on, boys, let's go get your brother, you know, and just going off, uh, just going off to go get Jesus. But this is where they started. This is where James started. James started doubting Jesus, okay? He, he doubted that he was God. He loved him like a brother, James loved him like a brother, but doubted his true identity. Just couldn't see it. Just couldn't see it. So then that leads to another question then. What changed? That leads to the next question. How did James come to believe in Jesus? What changed? You know, what, and, and, and you could almost even ask yourself this in your own thoughts. If you had a child or sibling that claimed to be divine, what would it take to convince you otherwise? Okay, and, and, and we know that anyone that claims to be God outside of the triune God of the Bible is nuts. 
Okay, so I'm not trying to indicate that there could be possibly uh, someone divine in your family. No, no, no. I'm not saying that at all, but just to get yourself in their shoes, to place yourself in their point of view where they were at, and the Bible hadn't been fully written yet, and they didn't have all of that revelation, making it easy for them to discern things so clearly, the ability that we have now, to place ourselves in their shoes. What would it take? What would it take? Would it take a miracle? Would it take performing a great feat of illusion? I I don't think that would work for us, because no one thinks David Blaine is God. No one thinks David Copperfield is God. No one thinks Penn and Teller are gods. <laughs> Thankfully so. <laughs> They're all weird. <laughs> I love watching their illusions. But what we would do is somebody did a big, beautiful miracle, we would come up with a scientific example of why it was fake. We would try to prove it using our science and our knowledge and our insight and our expertise and our history. Someone would just show up and say, okay, if I made that levitate, would that convince you? And we'd all be like, okay, there's a string somewhere. No, magnetic force. You got a magnet you built into the concrete and it's polar, polar, and you got it built into the object and it's pushing it up. It's the, that's, there's a wind tunnel. There's something. I'm tired. That's what it is. I'm not seeing this straight. It's my fault. I'm going to bed. You know, that's why I don't think God talks through burning bushes very much anymore like that. I think that's why it was something that Moses got to enjoy. But if my toothbrush caught on fire, I would not stop and talk to it. Okay, I just wouldn't. I'd get a fire extinguisher and I would put out God. That's what I would do. You know, I would, (laughs) you know, if it up again, (laughs) hop, so, and God knows not to talk to me that way. (laughs) We wouldn't get very far, you know, plus that's why he gave us his word, okay, something that is clear and we can understand and that is completely true and reliable and relevant, okay, but they didn't have all that back then, so putting ourselves in their shoes, what would it take? What would it take? Here's what it took for James. Uh, Paul came out uh, when he was doing his letter writing, and he helps us have a glimpse as to a possibility, uh, even a probability, what changed. What it took to convince James that Jesus was more than just a brother. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, he says, Then he, Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. In other words, Jesus died on a cross, Then he rose again, and after he resurrected and is walking on the earth, as he's walking around, he appears to the people at the gravesite, Mary and whatnot, there at the gravesite. Then he appears to James. Okay, he appears to James, then to all the rest of the apostles. He goes to his brother. I'm telling you, seeing somebody raised from the dead, that might be convincing right? I'm not talking flat line, clear. I'm talking three days dead. Stinking, smelly, rotting flesh happening, three days dead, okay? You start to decompose at that point. Rigor mortis beyond, okay? Three days dead, and then I wonder what that would have been like. Just out of curiosity, I like to play this out in my head like a movie. So, so join with me for this, what this might have been like. Let's say, you know, James is at home. He has his other brothers. You got like, you know, you know, Simon might be there, and you got Judas there, and you got all these other brothers there, right? And they're maybe, you know, because they like writing psalms and songs, maybe they're writing a sad ballad together, you know, about the loss of their brother. And they're just like, you know, he was a great guy. Who knows what was going on? Then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, Okay. And I know it probably didn't happen exactly like this, but, but close, right? You know, so there's a knock at the door. And then, you know, James and Simon and Jude, they get up. And they're like, okay, what do we do? Let's go to the door. We don't really feel like having visitors today. You know, our brother, he's only been dead a few days. We just kind of want to be alone. I want some just stress-free. But, you know, oh, won't they just go away? Won't they just leave me? Maybe they'll just, maybe if we just turn the lights off and we hide behind the sofa... No, they're more persistent than those guys on bicycles with white shirts. 
Okay, let's go ahead and let's answer the door. So they open the door, and there's Jesus, their dead brother. And he's staring at him in the face. And he, he looks at James and says, hey, James. Looks over his shoulder and goes, hey, Jude. Don't be afraid. Take that sad song and make it better. <laughs> No? <laughs> Come on, that whole story for one joke, it was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so he appears to James, right? And then he says, James, told you I was God. And then James says, yes, sir, you are. Yes, sir, you are. And James believed from that point forward to the point of his own murder and execution where the leaders took James and they sat him down at one point and they said you stop saying Jesus is God and James says Jesus is God and they killed him for his faith James believed in his brother so fervently, so absolutely, so convincingly. And I tell you, nobody knows you better than your family. Right? Nobody knows you better than your family. If ever you think somebody has all their act together, talk to their siblings. (laughs) <laughs> you think, man, they got it. They're just the best person. I bet they never have a temper tantrum. I bet they never screw up. I bet they never have a problem. Talk to their spouse. <laughs> okay? Right? Talk to their parents. Nobody knows you better than family. If you think I have my whole act together, my wife's right there. She'll be glad to tell you my failings. She remembers them very well. <laughs> okay if you think i was a beautiful jesus-like child my mom's right there she'd be glad to tell you more like satan than jesus growing up okay <laughs> she'd be glad to tell you okay it's it's no one knows you better than family and james is jesus's family he knows him better than anybody and james died Believing Jesus was God. Knowing that Jesus was sinless. That he had a perfect upbringing. He didn't swear. He didn't lie. He didn't cheat. He didn't lust. He didn't, all the things. He never did. He was never prideful or arrogant. He, you know, he might have been rude, but that's not a sin. So we all have permission. Um, but, <laughs> you know, he, he never sinned. And James would know if that was true because he was his family and lived with him all day for over 30 years. You cannot live a lie that long. James knew who Jesus was. And James, when he saw the resurrected Lord, believed when he saw that this is what happened, Jesus is alive, then he believed. And in both Matthew and in Mark, it's neat that Jesus says, those who do the will of my father, those are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. In other words, his family are those who do God's will. That's the charge of this whole letter. That's the charge of this entire letter from chapter one, verse one, all the way to the end of chapter five. The letter of James is about doing the will of God so that we can be his family. Not that doing those works cause salvation. Doing those works are a result of salvation. It's a result of it. So James would have almost like a two-part message to it, if you will. Do you believe in Jesus as Lord and God and Savior? If not, stop doubting. 
confess your sin and accept him as Lord and Savior. He died on the cross for you and he rose again for you and that all your sin can be forgiven. You cannot get forgiven on your own. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is offered through Christ to you. Okay, we, we can't fix it. It always drives me bonkers when people talk about works-based salvation. Okay, the modern-day Jews do it, and the Muslims do it, and on and on it goes. They all, of the other religions, they have a works-based system. And it seems weird, because if I am not perfect, then that means I am the problem. And if I am the problem, how can I also be the solution? That doesn't make sense. It's not logical. If I did something wrong, is there anything I can do to change the unchangeable past? Okay, if I were to offend you, violate you, if I were to wrong you, steal from you, or whatever, is, can I ever make that completely right? No. Even if I steal something and I give it back, even double fold, there's still a break of trust. There's still violation. There's still a break in the relationship there. There is still hurt and wrong that's there. Okay, I cannot fix it. And I am not perfect. No one here is perfect. We're all in the same sinking ship together. No one is perfect. There is none who do, not, who do good. No, not one, the scripture says. Okay, no one is perfect. Therefore, we cannot be the solution. The solution has to be above us, greater than us. And that's what Jesus is, is the solution. That's what James finally grasped. And that's the starting point, accepting Jesus as Savior, admitting you have sin, you are not perfect, you need forgiveness, and the ultimate forgiveness only comes from God. And then if you are a Christian, you have accepted Lord as Savior, what James then would do is to say, and he's largely writing to religious people. That is James' big focus. We'll be seeing that next week and as we go on. He is writing to, largely he's writing to religious people. He mentions a couple chapters later about the church and his charge to the church. Okay, so that's who James is really focusing on. But the problem is they know a lot, but they're not doing a lot. They got a lot of facts they agree with, but it's not making any difference in their life. And he wants them to go from believing to behaving. He wants them to go from uh, confession to conviction. That's what James wants to see happen. A lot of people say, well, they believe in Jesus. And what they mean by that is that they believe a certain set of facts. And James is gonna say, well, that's nice. Demons believe that too. Demons agree with certain set of facts too, but it doesn't mean that that's what it takes. Having Jesus as Lord and following him, that's what believe is supposed to mean. When you look throughout the New Testament, it says that all who believe upon Jesus will have an everlasting life. That believe is not about agreeing with a certain set of facts. That believe is about a conviction that leads to action, that you are going to follow, that you are going to devote your life to honoring and doing his will. To stop saying that you just believe, but you're going to start to do the behavior. That's going to be James' focus. So my charge then from that to you and those that are online and watching the video later is, have you accepted Jesus as your savior? Step number one, have you gotten there? If not, will you? And if you won't, why not? What's holding you back? And then the second one would be to everyone else. If you have accepted Jesus as savior, then what is God wanting you to do right now not worried about what he wanted you to do yesterday for some of us that were involved in the food fair it's real easy to say i served god yesterday so now i don't have to do anything for a while my quote is met <laughs> baloney okay what is the risen savior asking for you now right now 
What is he wanting from you? That's going to be the focus of our study. And I hope that you are willing to just join us as we look through this study, as we grow to not be appreciative of Je- and admire Jesus' family, but that we will be appreciative and admire Jesus himself as we become part of his family, doing the will of the Father together. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father,